Okay, welcome to um, lecture eight of digital systems design. And this is for Friday 9-11, uh, uh, an ominous day uh, that goes down in infamy. Um, hopefully we won't have too much going on on 9-11 um, this year. Uh, so here's the schedule. Uh, so we're due to start our review of logic design, and I will get to that today. I just have a few more slides to go through in Unit 2, uh, Unit 2D. Two, uh, we'll, so we'll finish that up. We'll do logic design. Uh, first, I want to say a few words about the, about the lab. But notice, once we finish the logic design on the 23rd, we'll have a chapter over logic design. Uh, we'll have a test over the chapter on logic design. Okay. Um, so let me uh, switch to the... Uh, the lab. So here's the here's the lab sheet for uh, this week. This is a little more complicated, and we are going to uh, use a clock this time. So that's going to be one of the differences. So our constraint file, our constraint file will include a clock, and I'm going to shrink this down just a little. This is so hard to get. The... Anyway, yeah. So uh, we're going to model this uh, this. Uh, a 74HC190. It's a it's an up down counter, and uh, this sort of harkens back to the day when I I kind of again sort of envisioned creating these uh, standalone chips and then uh, instantiating them and hooking them together to make a you know this is a four bit up down counter hooking them together to make an eight bit. It, it is interesting to look at these parts, but. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure that that's a really good idea. And so probably what we're going to do more than that is we're just going to uh, uh, directly create the 8-bit counter. Um, but uh, it's good to kind of look and see uh, how these things used to be done. And it's still in, it still gives us some insight into uh, different ways we can implement things. Um, it turns out s some of the fastest uh, adders usually sort of group a few bits together and so you have maybe like a 4-bit or an 8-bit carry look-ahead adder or carry propagate adder, and then you daisy-chain that to another 8 bits, and you daisy-chain that to another 8 bits. And so your 32-bit counter or adder is really 4, uh, or maybe maybe yeah, maybe yeah 4 uh, 8-bit carry look-aheads daisy-chained together. So you're sort of using a mixture of um, technology because a 32-bit carry look-ahead or carry propagate is a lot of gates. So sometimes you break that up in these smaller chunks and daisy chain the chunks together. And it's still pretty fast. It's just not quite as fast uh, as it would be if you did all 32 bits, but uh, in one carry look ahead adder. But your, but your, your overhead goes up uh, pretty much exponentially. And so, um, so sometimes it's better to do it in chunks. Anyway, um, although when you have 2 billion transistors on a chip, um, you can do a lot of stuff. All right. So anyway, um, so this this the 74H uh, HC190 uh, was a four-bit up-down counter, and it has parallel load capability. It has uh, it has its output, um, and um, and it has these flip-flops that basically allow the count to be all uh, displayed at one time, which is also kind of important. Um, and you have a bunch of control lines. And so this is kind of complicated. What's interesting is when you specify this 8-bit counter uh, and you, you, you basically create a vector and then you say add one to the vector, how does that get synthesized? I mean, you're not telling the synthesizer to use, say, uh, to divide it up into uh, groups of 4-bit carry look-aheads that are daisy-chained together. You're not doing that. You're... you're uh, you're just uh, you're just throwing this behavioral description to the synthesizer, and it's kind of doing whatever it wants, right? So you do have to think about these things, and and you do have to have some knowledge about how uh, these things are implemented in in good ways and better ways and bad ways, so that you can sort of look and see what the synthesizer does, and then make sure that you um, you know that you're happy with that. Uh, because if the performance is not what you need, you may have to go get down in the weeds and 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 get down several layers of abstraction below uh, your behavioral level. So uh, it's good then to have some familiarity with how uh, optimized parts that have stood the test of time 
were constructed. So I guess that's that's a pitch for this a little bit, but um, but synthesizers are getting better and better, and and so to a great extent maybe you can just trust them. All right. Well, anyway, um, so it's good. And here this description of the signals. These are the flip-flop outputs. So the flip-flops actually hold the outputs that the outside world sees. And the advantage of that is you can you can uh, you can preload these all and then display it at the same time. And that way you don't get weird uh, you don't get rippling effects through your count values that uh, can be very upsetting to downstream logic. Uh, because while it's settling, the downstream logic can see, uh, you know, a, a, a flurry of many, many different uh, numbers that can be, uh, could screw up the downstream logic. So you don't really want that. You want to, you want to, you want to get everything preloaded and then bam, uh, pop it in the flip-flops and display it. All right, or output it. Uh, so, so this ripple clock is what connects to the next chip, uh, and the uh, parallel load. So you can you can preload with the parallel load a, a predetermined value, and then you can count it up or count it down. Uh, uh, I guess one classic use is to preload a value and then count it down to zero, and then when it hits zero, then you do something, and then you preload another value, count it down to zero. So it's a kind of a way of building your your own little timer module. Um, um, and so here's here's sort of the operating. So count up, count down, and hold. And so you have the uh, the uh, parallel load. So so that's an active low. So you want that high when you're counting. And um, then the uh, then the up down to count up. You want it active low. And when you want it uh, down, you want it high. For, so load it low for up and high for down, kind of backwards. And uh, and then if it's if if uh, if you're holding, then it, this this input doesn't matter. And then chip enable, you have to enable the chip in order to uh, make it count. And but you can parallel load it regardless of what uh, these are set at. Um, and then the the uh, the C, so the C, the CE is an active low uh, count enable. And uh, the C not chip enable, and the CP is the uh, that's the clock input, and so it's the edge of this clock that causes the count. And it, depending on how it's configured, it'll cause it to count up or down, or it won't do anything. And then finally, the uh, the uh, D. Let's see, yeah, those are the data inputs. So that's that's what gets parallel loaded um, so those are that's your parallel um, those that's the four bits of parallel load d0 d1 d2 d3 and that's it all right so you can see that there are four control signals the count enable up down input clock input and parallel load and then, then there's some control outputs uh, ripple clock output and terminal count output and um, the, I think the terminal count output is what synchronizes the display of the outputs. Um, not sure about that. Uh, but anyway, I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but you should read through this and see if you can make sense out of it. And here's how these get hooked up in daisy chain. So four bits here and four bits there, and that's sort of how it works. This controls whether you're counting up or down, and, um, and we really, and this doesn't even show the implementation of the uh, uh, of the uh, terminal count output. All right, uh, and let's see, yeah. All right. Um, so on the very log module, we're going to use the lower eight LEDs as the counter outputs, and the upper eight slide switches uh, as the parallel load data. And we'll show the value to be loaded in the upper eight LEDs. So we'll be using all sixteen LEDs, uh, and we'll be using the upper eight switches for the parallel load. Uh, the push buttons will be used to cause the up or down. Uh, 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 so, and that'll be the, the up button uh, with the clock uh, down count. Uh, let's see, so yeah, so if you want to count up with the clock, we we'll use the up button. If you want to count down with the clock, we'll use the down button. Parallel load will be the left button, and, uh, and that'll load on the clock edge. And then the reset and uh, 
reset and uh, so the reset's going to be uh, the right button and um, so one of the interesting things if you try and make your reset asynchronous um, you can see if that is easy to do or if that causes all sorts of problems and you can look at that by uh, by uh, by looking at the elaborated design when you make that change um, of course the way you do that is you put it in uh, you would put that in the always block sensitivity list versus not versus having only the clock in the sensitivity list um, so the board does have a clock uh, the board has a 100 megahertz clock now what do you think will happen if you connect the 100 megahertz clock directly to the clock input of your counter your counter is going to count really fast and you won't be able to see LEDs I mean you'll see them you'll see them sort of glowing but you won't be able to see them changing in a meaningful way because it's going to happen uh, at a very high rate of speed, 100 million per second uh, ticks on the count. So what we have to do is slow the clock down, and there's several ways to do that. But here's some code that shows you how to do that. We create a 32-bit counter, we drive it with the clock, and then we pick off whichever bit we want, which will scale our time frame. Uh, and that, that actually works pretty well. Um, Okay, and so here's some, so we give you some of this code to start with, and then um, also um, talk about uh, uh, how, how, uh, how the, uh, this is the port list here. So I give you the module counter eight underscore eight bits, and then here are the, here are the signals. So uh, the LEDs, which is all 16, the switches, which is, uh, it could be all 16, but I think we just do the um, we just do the lower uh, the upper eight switches, I think, and then we use the push button, and then we have um, the four push buttons uh, and the clock. Those are the external signals, and this is what the constraint file also needs to describe. Um, the buttons, uh, yeah, the buttons are all uppercase for revision C. Um, the so. Look at the constraint file. And make sure uh, I should probably change this. Maybe I will over the weekend if I get time. But uh, but look at your constraint file, and then you'll see how how these how these signals need to be. The problem was uh, the 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 revision B constraint file used lowercase, and the revision C used uppercase. And I so here I mix the cases. So you may want to look at, at the constraint file and make sure that the case and the exact spellings are exactly as they are in the constraint file. Uh, otherwise, the signals won't match and you'll get a mismatch. And you'll see that when you elaborate the design because your, your input would, your, it would just not be connected to anything. All right, and so the LEDs are outputs, the uh, uh, switches are inputs, the clock's an input, and the reset's an input, the up count is an input, the down count's an input, and the parallel load is an input. And um, <coughs> and then we have an internal register uh, that's eight bits. It holds the count. And then we have um, uh, an internal wire for our slow our slowed down clock. And um, then we have our little slow clock module. And um, so. Uh, we set that up here, and uh, so anyway, you can see, um, and then you can put your continuous assignments here to set the LEDs. The LEDs, uh, the upper eight LEDs should always equal whatever's uh, set in those set switches in those upper eight set uh, slide switches, and the lower eight LEDs should always equal whatever the count, the current count value is. And here's what it looks like when you elaborate the design. And you can see that the signals are connected. And here are the output LEDs. There are all the inputs. Your elaborated design may look slightly different because this is one of the things, every new version of Vivado, they've played around with how these things are presented. And they've actually made it a, a fair amount better over time. All right, so just read through the rest of this. And, uh, and I think you'll find this uh, to be an interesting lab. And then here's a little turn-in sheet. Okay. 
and um, I'm, I'll probably go over this carefully over the weekend to make sure there's uh, I'll, I'll probably get rid of the revision B stuff in there because this year we're not using any revision B boards okay enough of that and enough of this and then let's go to the slides we'll pick up uh, where we left off and I'll put my self back in there if I can find my cursor okay so and I may have to shrink this down just a little bit I'll try up here and see how that works okay now this we looked at this slide uh, on Tuesday and I just wanted to point out it since these are uh, these are four bits because they go up to 12 so it takes four bits to hold these numbers you should have had a three to zero here indicating that every end element of this matrix was a four-bit vector and then it preloaded those four-bit vectors with these values and it stored them with uh, four rows and uh, three columns and notice we numbered the rows 0 1 2 3 and we and we numbered the columns 0 1 2 but we but we organized the bits within uh, the each of the four-bit vectors 3 to 0 and, and this is typical ordering, because normally we do count our matrix from zero, you know, we count our rows 0, 1, 2, 3, we count our columns 0, 1, 2. We don't count them 3, 2, 1, 0, and 2, 1, 0. Uh, so we normally change the ordering, but the bits within these words, we do order them 3, 2, 1, 0, because the left bit would be the high order bit, the right bit would be the low order bit. So we, so, and we can definitely make these things so that they make sense to us, but it takes a little getting used to this. Okay, all right, and then you can print out you can print out the part element by just specifying matrix A three row three column one, row three one two three column one seven. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, I'm sorry, zero one two three and column zero one. It's eleven. Yeah, my bad. Always start with zero. Okay. Um, Okay, parity generator. Uh, so we're going to use Verilog to represent a parity generator using a lookup table. And uh, so we have a four-bit input, and we have uh, that's that's our that's our data that we're trying to generate parity for. So what we have to do is count up the number of ones, and uh, if it's even, we have to make the fifth bit a one. If it's odd, we have to make the fifth bit a zero. So it's going to be four. Uh, four data bits basically plus an odd parity bit and so uh, so the odd parity bit can be stored in a ROM and uh, so let's see how this would work so here's uh, here's our four bit input so these are the these are the that's the data and it's basically just 0 through 15 or 0 through F and uh, and so for instance for zero, the uh, the the odd parity bit there the the odd parity bit uh, is specified out here. So for instance, no one, so we have to add a one to make it odd. Now they made a couple of mistakes on this uh, five bit lookup table. So this is the lookup table here. Uh, And um, so, see if you can find the two mistakes. Anyway, I don't know why they didn't fix them, but I just left them since they were there. So let's see. So we have that's even. So that's a mistake. Uh, that's odd. That's uh, no. That's uh, that's odd. That's odd. That's even. So that's a mistake too. So you always want to have the number of ones should equal an odd number. And if it doesn't, then uh, then our, our parity generator screwed up. So we'd have to fix this. And we put in these, we put in ABCD, and then we get out five bits. But really, truth be known, we really only need one output column because uh, the PQRS are always going to be exactly equal to ABCD. So uh, I would not have used a, uh, I wouldn't have used a, I think a four-bit lookup table. Is just fine. Uh, is just fine, 
and it has one output, and then one output's a parity bit, and that parity bit is appended to the original input vector. But that's how they did it. They're the two mistakes. All right. Um, and you can see that uh, back when we did uh, our MUX4 this week, that uh, that it gets synthesized to a LUT6 with six inputs. That's that's how it works. The four the four inputs and the cell A cell B, and it's just implemented as a LUT6. And what would that look like? Well, that's what it looks like. Uh, these of course would be don't cares. If A and B are zero, we're selecting for I1 zero one. If A and B are zero one, we're selecting for I uh, I zero I1. If A and B are uh, zero one um, or one zero, we're selecting for I two, and if they're one one, we're selecting for I three, and obviously we have to have two possibilities: uh, where the input is a zero, then we output a zero, and where the input is a one, we output a one. So here uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and we have one output y. So in theory, uh, yeah. So, so because um, this is really simplified, I mean, obviously, if you normally had one, two, three, four, five, six input variables, you would have uh, you would have sixty four rows. Uh, but we don't need sixty four rows. Uh, we only need these rows uh, to make it work. However. Your LUT6 does have 64 rows, and so what you have to do is go through and, and populate the output correctly to make all those rows work uh, correctly, and that's what the synthesizer will do. It actually does use all 64 rows, and it just, so you have, so for instance, in this case, you have a row where this is zero, and A and B are zero, and the output's zero, but then you have the case where all these are zero, where all these are one, I mean, where, where it's zero, zero, one, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1. So you have eight examples of this row to fill in all these don't cares. And you have eight examples here, and you have eight examples here, and you have eight examples here. So for every row, you actually have eight rows in your, in your final truth table. Uh, because you do have to fill out all 64 rows because they exist. When you have a LUT6 in your FPGA, it has 64 outputs for Y, 64 options for Y. And, and so you have to put Y as zero for these eight rows and Y of one for these eight rows. Well, actually, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, that's what you have to do, eight for each row. So crazy, huh? But anyway, um, all right, so here's a parity generator. So we have uh, our top level module with X and a Y. X is gonna be a four bit vector. Uh, and our output Y is gonna be a five bit vector with the appended parity bit. So, um, so here is the, uh, so now we, we have defined a uh, parameter here. Uh, and this is, this is, uh, it's a, uh, it's it's a sixteen, uh, it's a sixteen bit uh, word, and it has, uh, and it's made up of, uh, it ha has this organization, so sixteen bits, it's one zero zero one zero one one zero zero one one zero one zero zero one and so what we do is we take uh, we take we assign the parity bit so um, so our output y is our input x plus uh, uh, concatenated with the parity bit and uh, x is the this is indexed by x so if x is zero then we have then the parity bit is a one. If x is one, the parity bit is a zero. If x is two, 
the parity bit. I don't know why. Uh, so zero, one, two. Yeah, that's right. Still odd. If it's three, we add a parity bit. If it's four, uh, it's just a single bit, so that's odd. If it's five, there's two bits, so we have to add a parity bit. If it's six, there's two bits, we have to have a parity bit. If it's seven, that's odd. If it's eight, that's odd. If it's nine, that's even, and we have to add a parity bit. If it's uh, A, that's even, we add a parity bit. If it's B, that's odd, so we don't need one, and so forth. And finally, 15 is even, so we have to add an area pit. Uh, and F is 1, 1, 1, 1, so that's 4, 1, so we need to add a fifth one. And that's how that works. So that's pretty clever, and um, that'll do the trick. Um, okay, so l let's talk about some loops. These are, these, uh, you can use these, but most of the time these get used, I don't know, a lot of times they get used in test benches. I've never used a forever loop, but you can do that. Uh, and sometimes it can be, it can be sort of a, a, a loop that, uh, that, that then you put the rest of it. It can be in your top level module and, uh, all the rest of your code, uh, then goes inside this uh, forever loop. Uh, so sometimes that's not a bad way to do it. Uh, and uh, what they're showing here, though, is how you would make a clock. And uh, and this is this is uh, this this would only be useful uh, in. Um, I think this would only be useful in a test bench. I can't imagine why you would want to synthesize this because normally these clocks have to be synchronized. Uh, with other clocks and yeah we normally use a a real in, a real world input clock and we, we we don't normally make one up in software and um yeah and and this might not give you a really great square wave uh because it's only 10 nanoseconds and your and your inverter gate here uh, might look more like a sawtooth or a triangular wave than a real square wave clock. So I guess if you slowed it way down with a big, big delay here, then it might work okay. But anyway, uh, so this, yeah, this example, useful in test bench. Um, okay. Um, so here's some other loops. Notice that, uh, that, we don't have the plus plus and the minus minus in Verilog. Uh, so if you want to, like here you can do it. This is a for loop and that's legal. Uh, I equals zero, of course you have to have defined I ahead of time. And then I less than 16, I equals I plus one. You can't just go I plus plus, not legal in Verilog. And here we have a, this uh, eight bit register array and so this is a this is basically just eight bits, and um, so you're gonna you're basically go, you're going to take uh, you, when you set this up. So what? Yeah. So we define this eight bit register right here. So let's look at this and make sure we understand it. So the first uh, the first index here is the word size, and the word goes from higher order bit to lower order bit. And they're 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 eight bits. So every word in the array is an eight-bit word. And then we have uh, 16 rows. Now here we did number them 15 to zero, but I I normally would number them zero to 15. I don't know I don't know why they elected to do that. Uh, but I I normally call the first row zero, not 15. In any event, this little piece of code here uh, is a for loop that automatically sets every single one of these eight these bytes in this uh, the, uh, the, of these 16 bytes in this array to zeros. And there's eight zeros here, obviously. Okay, and then then down here, we use another for loop, a far equals zero, less than four, i equals one, i plus one. And then uh, our C out is we add the four bits of A with the four bits of B. Uh, so, um, yeah. And we get a we get a C out, we get a carry out and a sum. And we get a sum for all four bits. And 
uh, and we get a carry out from each of our bits. And notice here we're using, uh, we are using blocking uh, statements. And the carry in uh, is assigned the value of C out uh, for the next trip through this uh, logic. So the order does matter here. Okay. Uh, here, here we uh, define max as 100. And so when we, wherever we use the word tick max, uh, it's going to substitute in 100. So while count is less than 100, begin, count equals count plus 1, end. So this is going to stay in this loop until count counts up to uh, 100. And then we display the number uh, on, the, on the console monitor. This is strictly for use in your test bench. And the when and within a while loop, your condition is tested before each iteration. You know that if you do a do while loop, it's test it's run once and then it's tested afterwards. And this is test bench use. Okay, um, you can you can use this construct in your while statement. That's fine, but you can't dis that that this display cannot be synthesized. That's a test bench function. Okay. Um, you can do this. This does this. This repeats eight times. It's another loop. I've never used this uh, nomenclature because I, I just have never encountered a situation where once you powered up, I needed something to happen eight times and never again. That's a little bit of a strange event, I think. So repeats until the sequ repeats the sequential statements for specific times. Okay, testing Verilog code. We do that by simulating it using our test bench. And um, your test bench can be complicated or simple. And uh, you want it to help you debug your time, uh, debug your, sorry, debug your design. And, and uh, obviously you want to do that so that you can get your design uh, finished and, uh, and downloaded into the part, or you can make your integrated circuit as fast as possible. Uh, so this test bench is totally different than the synthesis. Um, and th pretty much the test bench is where we use all the initial blocks. Now, when we have an FPGA, like I've said before, because we do have a bit file that we put in the, this, this uh, FPGA at power up, um, we can, in fact, initialize it, uh, all the variables, to whatever we want. So we can use initial blocks when we're writing uh, Verilog code for, for uh, FPGAs. But when we're writing Verilog code to make integrated circuits, you can't do that. It's not legal because the synthesizer is not going to do that for you. Uh, uh, so, And this is the only place where, within the test bench, is the only place where the delays that you specify in your code have any meaning or effect. And so let's look. This is the test bench that you guys ran with your tutorial. Now, uh, unfortunately, this test bench is, is a complex test bench. So it probably was difficult for you to understand it. And I'd like you to really look at it. Now that you've done the tutorial, you should look at this and see. So here's your test bench. Uh, uh, so module name, uh, tutorial test bench module. And notice, notice that the sensitivity list here uh, is open parenthesis, close parenthesis, semicolon, done. But you do have all these internal signals. Uh, we never put anything in the uh, in the sen in the uh, port list. Sorry, I said sensitivity list. I meant port list. We never put anything in the port list of a test bench because a test bench doesn't communicate with the outside world. All it does is send inputs into your module, your top level module, get outputs from your top level module, and then uh, display messages to the operator. Display, display these uh, these signals, or maybe even display, uh, maybe even check the signals to see if they're correct, and display, you know, correct or not correct, or in this case, output matched, output mismatched, uh, things like that. Uh, within this test bench, 
we do have uh, we do have our uh, uh, we instantiate uh, our top level module, which in our case was tutorial. We give it an instantiation name, tut one. Uh, you could make that that could be anything you want. We used in this case we're using name dissociation or the dot notation dot led paren leds and dot switches paren switches and then within this notice we have a function well we haven't even studied functions yet really so this is kind of a curveball uh, but functions are declared within the module that they're used or you can have a separate file and you can do a tick include the file uh, so you can have a bunch of functions you've already predefined and you can include them in a module you're writing uh, by using the tick include um, uh, directive. Uh, but in any event, normally you define them within the module. So here it is, it's in red. And, uh, and this, to, this function uh, is called, uh, and, we haven't, and since you, we haven't studied functions yet, this probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but basically functions, you, functions can you input, you, get, you can input a number of different variables but you can only output one variable. However, it can be a vector. In this case, we're inputting one vector uh, and we're outputting uh, another vector. So the, 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 uh, the, there can only be one output though. And the, the output here is expected LED, eight bits of expected LED. And the input is uh, the setting of your switches, uh, eight different switches and their setting. And so if um, so, then then this function basically calculates what the correct expected output should be using essentially uh, the same similar equations to what's actually in your in your mod in your module under test. This is the uh, uh, the module under test. We call it, we call it the device under test DUT, uh, and that's your top level module the tutorial. And here. Here is your function that generates the expected value. And so the way this actually gets used in your code, this is just the de definition of the function. And, and it defines it just like your module. So LED1 is expected to be the inverse of the setting of switch 0. LED, sorry, LED0. LED1 is supposed to be the anding of uh, slide switch 1 with the inverse of slide switch 2. So if slide switch one is on, slide switch two is off, then the LED should be on. And if the either of these other switches in the other position, then it should be off. And this is a bitwise and, but these are single bits, so it doesn't really matter. It could be logical too. And then LED three is two and three anded together. And then uh, LED two is the expected result for LED one or with the expected result for LED three. And then the other uh, LEDs, four, five, six, and seven, are simply uh, just a direct reflection of the current of the switch position of switch uh, four, five, six, and seven, and then that's end end function. Okay, and um, yeah, and uh, so anyway, now here's how it's used. So the function actually shows up down here where you say the word expected underscore LED because expected underscore LED is the name of the function. And the name of the function defines, uh, in this case, the vector that's, that's returned. And it's an 8-bit vector. So what happens is uh, you, you get returned the expected uh, LED result for whatever setting of the switches you have in switches. And here's the switches. So you you what what we actually do? We have a little for loop here, and th so this is an initial block, and then we have begin, and then we're going to do a for loop and do all this stuff, and then we're going to do uh, we're going to do an end of the for loop, and we're going to do an end of our initial module or uh, of our initial block, and then we'll do the end module. Now remember, normally normally we use initial blocks in test benches, so so here's our for loop, and, and within our for loop, begin, and then we have an if, this, and else, and finally an end. And this is our display command. So, so we, 
we wait 50 nanoseconds, and then we sweat, set the switches equal to I. Now, um, I is an integer, uh, so it actually, uh, our integers by default are 32 bits. But this is okay because we just use the lower 16 bits, or sorry, the, the lower 8 bits in this case, uh, and that's what our switches get set equal to. Uh, and so we delay 50 nanoseconds, and we set switches equal to I. So the first time through, the switches will all be zero. And then we wait 10 nanoseconds, and we, we set the, uh, the ELED, which is, which is, this is the internal register that we're, that we're uh, well, this is the internal register. And we're, we're going to, uh, yeah, so, uh, well, I'll show you what we do with that. So we do, exp we, 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 we wait 10 nanoseconds, and then we, we calculate for ELED what the, using the function, what the expected uh, switch setting, uh, what the expected LED setting should be for this given setting. Now, when they're all zero, then you can go, you can look at the function and compute and figure out what they should be. And I think uh, LED zero should be on because uh, if switch zero is off, then its inverse would make the LED zero on. And I think all the rest of them um, are going to be zero. Yeah, so I think, and all these will be zero. So, so I think for, LED, for, for the first value of I that is zero, our expected LED is going to be uh, switch zero is going to be on, and all the, uh, sorry, LED zero is going to be on, and all the other LEDs will be off. And that's what your function returns because of these equations here. And then you have an if statement. If the actual LEDs, which is returned by your tutorial here, you pass to the tutorial your current switch settings, and the tutorial re returns the current LED, the, what should be the LED outputs. And so then you say, okay, so uh, do my LEDs, that are output from my tutorial uh, top module match my expected LEDs. And if they do, you say LED output matches, and then you print the time at the time. Else, LED mismatches at, uh, the, t at, at the time. The expected uh, was uh, this, and the actual is that. And then you print out the expected LEDs and the LEDs. Uh, and it takes the expected LEDs and puts them into this uh, binary, uh, eight binary bits. And it takes the LEDs and puts them into these eight binary bits. And it, so it'll show you what where the error is. So that's this tutorial. Like I said, it is a little bit complicated. All right, let's talk about functions now that we've used one. So this is, uh, we, we in Verilog, we have functions and tasks. We'll talk about the tasks later. We're not going to talk about it now. Uh, they're similar. But there's a couple of differences. Uh, the function cannot drive more than one output, and it cannot contain delays. So none of the de no delays in functions are allowed, and you do you only get one output variable. But it can be a vector, like it was in the case we just looked at. The functions are defined in the module in which they're used. Although you can put them in files and load them within a tick include. Functions, again, no timing delays, and uh, you can't do pause edge, neg edge. Uh, pound delays, uh, none of that. So they get executed in zero time. And then uh, functions can have any, you can have a number of different input variables. They can be vectors even, but you can only have one output variable, it, but it can be a vector. And the variables declared within the function are local to that function. And the order of declaration within the function defines how many of the variables passed to the function by the caller are used. So, um, so that tells that tells you, you know, how things are working. Um, so let's see. Um, yeah. Uh, so they're passed in order. Functions can take, drive, and source global variables. So you can also use global variables inside of functions. Functions can be used for modeling combinational logic, and generally not for sequential logic. And functions can call other functions, but they can't call tasks. All right, so that's just a quick introduction to functions. 
So the test bench basically just it it it's it has no connection to the outside world. Therefore, its 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 port list is empty. But it it is a piece of code that provides uh, inputs to the module under test, receives outputs from the module under test, and then it may compare what it gets back with what's expected. Um, and then uh, and and it can be complicated or very simple. You don't even have to compare what's expected, but but you can do that by hand if you want uh, by just uh, displaying that in the uh, in the little uh, dis the timing diagram display window and see if it's showing you what you expected. And here's how it works. Four bit adder. So we have uh, uh, four bits of A, four bits of B, and a carry in, and it we sends back a sum and a carry out. Okay, that's great. So our, what would our test bench do? So this is what our test bench would look like. Now, again, this is going to be a more complicated one, uh, where we uh, where we we have an initial block that initializes these arrays. This is the array for the f first add in. That would be four bits of A. This is for the uh, uh, the carry in. Uh, so, and we're going to use we're going to do. Uh, uh, we're going to use um, 11 different inputs. So we have 11 values of A. We have 11 carry-ins. So some of the carry-ins are 0 and some of them are 1s. Three of them are 1s and the rest are zeros. So it's a single bit. And then we have the uh, augand array. And those are uh, 4 bits as well. And then... Uh, then we have our sum array and our single bit of carry out. And then what we do is we go ahead and do the math and we compare it to the uh, to the expected sum and the expected count. And so here it is. And I'll, I'll leave that for you guys to sort of pour over. But uh, here is your here is your here is your module under test. Again, you always have to put the, put your module inside your test bench. Uh, not the whole module, you just have to instantiate it. Uh, so you just instantiate the module and uh, and then it's going to get tested. So the test bench is going to provide the add in, the aug in, the carry in, the sum and the carry and it's going to uh, the carry in and it's going to evaluate the sum and the carry out. And so here it goes. Always begin um, for i equals 1 to n and uh, n gets defined uh, here as 11 by using a parameter statement. And so, uh, so here we have uh, i equals 1, i equal uh, I to 1 to n plus 1. And then we're going to display, we display each of our iterations here, display uh, 1, 2, 3. And then we're going to say the add n equals the aug n array. The aug n equals the aug n array. The carry in equals the carry in array. <coughs> so those are the inputs going into the test bench, the module under test down here. And then we're going to get back a sum and a carry out. Sum's going to be four bits. Carry out's going to be a single bit. <coughs> and then we say, does the sum equal the value we put in the sum array that should be the right answer? And does the carry out equal the value we put in the carry out array, which should also be the correct carry out. And uh, if it does, then we, uh, it will, if it's not true, if it's not equal, if it's not one, so they should both be, they should be, uh, we and these together, and some should be, and these are logical equals. So if it's logically true, that's a one. If this is logically true, that's a one. So when we and these together, that means they're both true, and that would give us a one here. But then we invert it logically here to make it zero. So so if it's a zero, so if it's so when we invert it, uh, it's going to be uh, z it's going to be uh, one when it's when there's a mistake, and it's going to be zero when everything's right. So if it's if it evaluates to one, that would be true. Then we execute what's in the if statement. And we write error, wrong answer. 
and we and then the uh, the else clause is we show correct, and then once we run through all uh, all eleven uh, of our instances, we display test finish, and that's it. And then finally, now this this instantiation statement here, you can put it you could put it up here, anywhere in here is fine. You you just have to include it somewhere, and you don't include it in the always block. You just put it in the module, and and because this is a continuous, continuously be, anytime any of these values change, that that changes what goes into the uh, uh, into the module under test, and it and it, then it will update the outputs. So that's that's how this one works. Hopefully that makes sense. So um, again, these are the expected results. And we, we, you have to sit down and, you know, how did you get these? Well, you looked at, uh, say, the one, you added 0, 1, 1, 1 to, uh, and, a, and a carry in of 0 to 0, 1, 0, 1. So we added 7 and 5, and we should get 12. Uh, so that would, be, uh, that would be C, and our carry out should be a 0. So uh, C and a carry out of 0. And you just do that for each one. So uh, you're adding these values. And that's all there is to the test bench. Again, that's your module instantiation. These are, these are uh, the, the module instantiation is a concurrent statement. And these are the expected outputs. And we're checking to see if they're both true. And then we're flipping it. And if it's false, then, then, then it's a 0. But when we invert it, that makes it a 1. And so then this will write error, wrong answer, and uh, else uh, correct. And that's all there is to it. Okay, so that finishes that. Let's see how we're doing. Uh, I guess we're really out of time. So maybe what I'll do is just stop here, and we'll start with the logic design review uh, next Monday. We'll have plenty of time to get that done. All right, we will see you next week.